I want you to remain on your feet. Plant your feet firmly down and extend your head like it was one of those antennas to catch the word of God from Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17. Now this I affirm and insist in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles live in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and hard-heartedness of heart. They've lost all sensitivity. They've abandoned themselves to licentiousness, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That's not the way you learned in Christ. For surely you've heard about him and were taught about him as truth is in Jesus. You were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to become renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. So then, putting aside falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbor, for we're members of one another. Be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is a need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, welcome to First Christian. We are a people who are first Christians. That's what we're about. We are following Jesus, and we would love to follow Jesus with you because we need help. We need your help in that venture of following after Jesus. There are two kinds of people in the world, at least two kinds. Two ways of living in this world. A woman went to the airport. She was going on a trip. She had her book. She needed something to eat. She picked up a bag of cookies, sat down with her snack, sat down with her book, and began reading and just eating the cookies. Well, the man seated right next to her began eating the cookies too. And she was incensed. I mean, she noticed it, thought, well, just maybe one cookie. But every time she would take a cookie out, he would take a cookie out. And she was getting upset and angry, but she didn't say anything at all. Two kinds of people in the world. Cookie takers, cookie sharers. Now the kinds of people that I want to talk about today, and I'll come back to our cookie woman in a minute, but the two kinds of ways that I want us to think about are these two. A life that is centered upon the self, and a life that is centered upon God. Now, there are lots of other kinds of ways that we could define and divide people up, right? But I want you to play this game because everyone fits into one of these two groups. So we could number off, number one, number two, number one, number two. Ones being those that are centered on the self, and twos centered on God, right? So we play this game. I mean, what, what, what does that mean? Now, some of you listening to me will say, well, I, I don't even buy into this because I don't know that I believe in God. Okay, okay. Still, these camps, these categories work. I don't even care about God. I don't care about being organized in this way. Well, play the game with me today and let's see what we can learn. So to have a life where you're centered upon the self is to be on team self. It's kind of a team of one. It's where you make all the decisions for yourself. You are the guide. Now you may have a boss, you may have a parent, and yet you are still the one that's in charge. Your landlord has some sway over you, the president has sway over you, but ultimately you are the final authority. And yeah, there's still boundaries. You have to obey traffic laws, most of them. You still go to work, you still go to school, but you're the one who's in charge. You can slap whoever you want. 
You could tickle whoever you wanted. You could eat whatever you want or steal or take or grab whatever you want. You could game all day long. You could code all day long. You are living for yourself. All decisions are made by you, by yourself. And you are together with yourself on the team of one. So that, that's the ones, okay? Life lived with the center of self. Team number two of life lived with God as the center is a little bit different because you have another that you're serving, someone else that's informing you, illuminating your life, someone beyond you that's providing you virtues and ways to live your life. Now, all of us, I don't care who you are, we're made in the image of God. And we have a choice about whether or not we're going to live into that image, whether or not we're going to put on the likeness of God. That choice is ours. And so, regardless of where you land in one of these things, whether you're a believer or not a believer, we might live a mix of these two. We might even have a shared understanding of who God is in this equation. I mean, don't we sometimes have kind of a negative view of God? That God's the rule maker? That God's the judge? God's the one enforcing all these rules that he's made? So, so we see God dressed up like a police officer. He's got a gun. He's going to enforce all the rules on us. Or, or God like a, a Supreme Court justice dressed in black who's ready to bang the gavel down. Or maybe it's some combination of all of these. He's got a gun in one hand because he's a policeman, and he's got a gavel in the other, and this is our view of God. Or maybe God's like this critical parent that we had, this voice in our head, or this absence of a voice, one that's not around us at all. Well, these two visions of life, being centered on self, being centered on God, the way that I've described them so far is kind of more like cartoon characters. And I want us to set them aside and think about these two ways as Paul informs us from this letter of Ephesians. To let him give us guidance to these two, number one, number two. All right? Now, in this series we've been involved in is called the God Process. We're in this process of becoming like God, becoming like Christ. And before we get to this, lest we think it's all about rules, we have to remember the God Project, which was our series for the most of the spring, the first part of Ephesians, where God's project from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, is to gather up all people, religious, irreligious, gather up all things, things in heaven, things on earth, gather up all of these things into Christ. And we're a part of that project. So if you find yourself dry, or empty, or lacking energy, it's possible that you're not involved in this process of what God is doing in life. Some power, some energy that He gives to you and provides to you to be able to become more and more like Him. All right, so let's look at Paul. Let's see what he has to say. In these verses in chapter 4, starting in verse 17, down through about verse 22, we get the picture of what life focused in on the self looks like. Paul says this, basically, don't walk like the nations think. What? Don't walk like they think? I mean, he's speaking to a Greek and a Jewish audience, and Greeks and Jews are really well known for their thinking. They're pretty proud of their thinking. In fact, we could name off the names of the many great Greek philosophers of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. And we may not know specifically what each of them taught, but those Greek thinkers influence us today. It's where we get libraries. It's where we get philosophy. It's where we get the academy and eventually the university. So they're very proud of their thinking. But Paul says, don't live like they think. Now, there are three things that he says in this little section that I want to highlight. Three things that he unpacks, and the first is in verse 17 and 18. This kind of thinking that's focused on the self is ignorant of God. It's a darkened mind. They're not dealing with the full equation. 
In some ways, they're clueless about God. And, and you know, if I'm representing them, I'd say, well, we don't really care, right? It, it doesn't matter that there's a God because I am my own God. I make my own choices. And so hearts are hardened or calloused to any notion that's beyond what the self decides to do. So that's the darkened mind, the ignorant mind. It's one that's separated from God. I am going to be my own God. Well, the second one is how this life is guided. It's guided by desire. Whatever you lust for or want or desire is what you seek. Whatever pleases you, whatever you enjoy, that's what you go for. And you abandon yourself to those desires. And Paul says that this will desensitize you. Whatever you chase for pleasure will begin to eventually break down your senses and you will need more and more. Not less and less, but more and more. And the example that he gives is sex. Pretty graphic one for us. To seek pleasure, to seek sexuality. If you abandon yourself to every sexual impulse, it will overtake you. Well, that's a kind of a stunning one, but I'd like to step back and stun you a little bit more. That God invented sex. Sex is good. It's fun. It's pleasurable. It is very natural. It's what God intended for the world. In fact, God is so brilliant that even when sex is corrupted by what we as humans do, it often results in generating life and more life. God is amazing with what he does there. So, God is not against sex. God is not negative towards sex. He invented it. But, Sex, like any other desire, if we give ourselves over to it, we will become desensitized. Our senses will fail us. All right, so the three things so far. We have this darkened mind. We're not dealing with reality where there's someone beyond ourself. We might be desensitized by our desires. And there's one more thing that he tells us, a third thing, that those desires, when we let them become our captain, corrode us. They corrupt us. Whenever we make my captain, my desires, we get confused. We don't think straight anymore. In fact, desire, when thwarted, raises up anger within us. Our thoughts shape us and guide us and direct us. And if we give ourselves over to these desires, they'll destroy us. I mean, it starts with just being obsessed with someone, maybe objectifying them on social media or virtually. And sometimes it can lead to even chasing that person down or stalking them to cause them physical harm because they have no idea who we are. And Paul provides a counter life to this, a different way of thinking. Because we know that the way that we think shapes how we live. The writer of Proverbs says this, as someone thinks, so they are. A lot of what parents try to do is not just lay out rules, but teach their children to weigh what's good and what's bad. I mean, even if we just get to that point that there are choices and they weigh the options, that's good. And ideally, we want them to choose the good option. So, it's teaching inside of a safe environment, how to make choices in life that lead us towards the good. All right, well, those are the verses that Paul talks about in terms of the self, a life that's centered upon the self. The other kind of life is a life that's centered upon God, where it's not toward the self, it's toward God. It's focused upon God. Paul tells us that we enter, in verse 20, into the school of Jesus, kind of looks at it and says, that's not what you learned from Christ. The way that you're living, that's, that's not the way to live. Instead, you heard things from Jesus. You were taught by Jesus. In fact, Jesus is truth. He's your trainer. He's the one that's guiding you through life. So in these two ways that we've got, a life centered upon God, a life centered upon ourselves, it could be that you find yourself a one or a two, or like most people, maybe a mix. Times when you're centered on the self, and times when you're centered upon God. 
And the example that, that Paul gives us of how we could live this life centered upon God, because surprise, surprise, I'm a minister. We're here in church. I'm not going to sneak up on you with the one I'm going to try to instruct you in. But here, the, one that he, the way that he tries to teach us about a life centered on God is through putting off clothes and putting on clothes. That we're to strip off the old self and put on the new self. Now, I don't know why this kind of cracks me up, that he's used sex as an example of the desires, and he says, get naked. Strip off the old self. All this clothing, this tattered, see-through clothing that just degrades you, take it off. It's shambles. It's a life that's so empty. And put on new clothes. Clothes that enhance you, that fit you. Clothes that are true to your character. Put on God because this God who made you wants to live in you. And this new fit is much more elegant because it helps you morph into the image of God. Now perhaps some of you listening will hear Adam and Eve made in the image of God. First people named in the Bible, made in the image of God. Every human being who's ever walked the face of the planet, made in the image of God. You, even if you deny God, you have God's serial number on you. What you choose to do with your equipment, what you choose to do with your life, is something that God has given to you to choose. While you're made in the image of God, you can choose to follow the likeness of something else, yourself. You can mark yourself in ways that corrode and denigrate yourself. And a lot of times we do make those choices that corrupt the image of God within us. But we have that choice of living toward God or living more toward ourselves. And at some point, maybe we realize that the fibers that we're wearing have cancer-causing chemicals in them and need to be taken off. That the ways that we're living in this life are not leading us to life. And they're leading us to death. And God invites us into this life of becoming. Becoming like what we confess. Well, I brought up that woman with the cookie. She was sitting there eating the cookies. And the man is taking her cookies. And she's not saying anything. But as fast as she can get a cookie, he grabs a cookie. She grabs a cookie, he grabs a cookie. She doesn't know what to say. She's so angry and upset. It finally gets down to the last cookie and he grabs it. Looks over at her, breaks it in half and gives her half. She takes her half and she doesn't say anything and leaves. Sits down, tries to think about what to do with this half of a cookie of a man that stole all of her cookies. Well, I want us to think about her for a minute as she sits there in another part of the airport. Because there's so many things I could talk about in the closing of this passage, and there are three things that I want you to catch. Three of them that kind of rise to the surface to help us know how to dress, to know how to clothe ourselves in our life. And it's, it's how we talk, and it's what we take, and it's the anger that's inside of us. So let's sit with this woman in the cookie and look at these things. How we talk. In verse 25, Paul begins to express that we're supposed to be people of truth. We're supposed to tell the truth, not be false, not deceive our neighbors. And he gives us a really important principle that's kind of surprising to me in verse 25. Don't deceive your neighbor, don't trick your neighbor, because you're members of one another. That doesn't mean someone who's like you in belief or non-belief. Not someone who's like you in your culture or your religion or your country or anything. This is your neighbor, someone who's just near you. And Paul says you're members of one another, you're connected to one another. So when you lie, when you deceive your neighbor, you're actually harming yourself. You're lying to yourself. If we think about what happens when we lie or when we stretch the truth just a little bit, we're trying to protect ourselves in some way. 
We can't come and say the full truth. We're trying to protect maybe our smarts or something that we've done wrong, something about our past, and we just want people to see us in a certain way. But when we lie, we're actually harming ourselves and our neighbor. How we talk matters. Talk that tears down and destroys is harmful. It destroys us. And I know with this language, we're actually talking about the standard talk for politic, political leaders, the standard talk for business leaders, to twist and bend the truth to whatever fits their need. It's the currency of how we talk. Let's lie. Or even in comedy, the comedy is made on tearing people down, making them feel bad. And we don't always realize that our words are like surgeon scalpels. We're causing people bodily harm and causing organs to be exposed, hurting them, harming them by our own words. How we talk is a matter of how we clothe ourselves. Well, the second one of what we take, he says, thieves, give up stealing. No more taking. Because when you take, you're actually taking from another. I mean, what's the big deal of taking things? I mean, it's just a cookie. That guy's just taking a cookie. What, what's the harm in that? The things that we take in life are big and small. Sometimes it's fraud, where we're defrauding an insurance agent. We're defrauding maybe our own company by taking a little bit of money, taking things, or even falsifying our hours. We are taking, and actually we're stealing from all of us. Same principle applies. We are members of one another. What we do to another actually harms us. Do we pay that college kid of our friend who's painting our house the same as we pay the immigrant worker whose name we don't know, whose language we can't speak? Or is it different? What we take matters. All right, the third one. How we talk, what we take, and the anger that is within us. I want you to pay attention to your anger, and I, and I say this fairly regularly, but anger reveals things to us. Anger is a great teacher. And so we're, we're sitting with this woman and her half of a cookie, right? The anger that she feels, and it's a great chance for her to reflect. I mean, Paul tells us in verse 26, be angry. He doesn't say don't be angry. There are occasions when we need to get angry, like when our cookies have been taken, right? When justice has not been served. Okay, well, maybe that's not a great example. But there are times when anger is justified. And yet I find that in today's world, anger is like our main way of operating. We're angry all the time, angry about everything, because we're right and everyone else is wrong. And we operate just assuming that we are right. So hold that half cookie the next time that you get angry and think about what maybe you have to learn from your anger. Because when you get anger, angry, it's a sign that your will has been violated. When what you want, what you will, has been thwarted. And pay attention to that, because it shows you what you really value. As that woman sat there with her half cookie and she ate it, she had a mind to go and talk to him, right? Then she opened up her bag and pulled out a bag of unopened cookies. You know what that means? She'd been taking his cookies. She was mad at him all of this time. A lot of times our view of the world is so focused in on ourself that we don't even realize that the very thing that we're angry at someone else about is what we ourselves are doing. Whenever we are angry, we're giving control over to that old self. We're giving control over and giving room for evil to take up residence and build a house in our hearts. And Paul says late in this chapter, shed, take off the clothing of bitterness, of wrangling, of wrath, of anger, of slander, of malice. When you see what someone else has that you don't have, let those things go away, because giving anger control means we're not wearing the right kind of clothes. We're not following Christ. Instead, 
We want to be people that are mimicking God. We want to imitate God. We want to be like Christ with our every move, as something of a filter for our life, a screen, something that filters out the ways that we could act. Are you finding yourself empty, hungry, dry, not having the energy? Let me tell you that the power of God is available to you, the very power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's a power that you can tap into, a power, a power that will fill you and feed you, water and nourish you, clothing that will clothe you in the most beautiful way possible because it will fit, it will be comfortable, and it will be the life of Christ that you're wearing. This is the life we're after, one that imitates Jesus. We don't just say that we follow Jesus. It's what we do. It's who we are. And I can tell you at First Christian, we don't have it all together, right? We're still on the way. Come and struggle with us in this journey of learning what it is to live our lives, letting Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit flow through our lives. Let's pray. God, we call upon you as the maker of heaven and earth, the maker of us, the one who stamped us with your image. We call upon you to create in us a new person from the inside out, that you would fill us, fill us to the full with the Holy Spirit. Teach us with our hands and eyes and heart, our feet, that we will be more and more like Jesus. Show us Show us what it looks like to wear these clothes by the way that we talk, by the way anger rises up within us, by even the things that we try to take from another. Help us, Father, we ask you, in the name of Jesus, to look more and more like Christ. And we pray this through Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.